Kia ora, I'm Sharon Brett Kelly. Today on The Detail, when the world's top golfers tee off in the US Open, fans will be watching for more than the perfect swing. It will be the first big tournament since the shock deal between the Saudi-backed Live Golf and the PGA Tour. Is the entire situation with the PGA and Live and the uncertainty as much of a gong show as it appears to those of us on the outside? Uh, gong show is a good way to putting it. I think I'm going to steal that line. I, I, the agreement that was announced last week, as best I can tell, there were five people in the world that knew this was happening before last Tuesday. You heard it. Even those very close to it, including the players, are still gobsmacked. We're certainly in a spot in time where there's a big question mark. Right. We don't have the answers we would like, so it's, it's hard to say. I, I know as much, if not less, than you. Uh, I don't think there's really been too much animosity between players in general. I think that's, that's been a lot more constructed from the media side than the player side. So this weekend, PGA loyalists and Rebels of Live will be playing side by side. It is, on the face of it, a great day for golf fans because now they get to see all the best players together in one place more often. And that was the one big problem over the last 12 months. The game was being fractured. It was becoming more divisive. People were at each other's throats. There was mudslinging from all sides. Now golf fans at least get to see the top players together more often. Well, that's not exactly how all fans feel about it. I can't bring myself to associate it. I, I feel dirty watching it. That's Trevor McEwen, sports journalist and fan. He's also worked high up in sports administration. He just can't decide whether or not to watch the US Open. I, I'm unsure at the moment. Um, and, and you normally you would. I don't, yeah, but I don't want to watch. I don't want to watch it from a point of anger of, of willing a non-live golfer to win it. Why? Why? Why do you feel so strongly about it? Because the I think the loyalists have been dealt a dud hand at a really bad time for international sport, where you stick to your morals and you stand your ground, and you end up coming out the loser. You know, to the tune of up to three hundred million dollars difference if you if you jumped and run with the rebels. It's not a great message to send to a generation of sports fans. These players, they're going to be side by side. Yeah, and there are a lot of people who like the drama and the theatre of that. And it is dramatic. And if you watch some of those behind-the-scenes reality TV series like Drive to Survive and Full Swing, as it's called, in, um, in, the, in the golf environment, it adds to it but also distracts from it because it, it all comes back to money and and the, and the purpose of spending that money. And it's... It's kind of inescapable. But it's always been that way. It's, I mean, mon- money has always played a big role in professional sport. Co- of course it has, but, you know, it also goes to the source of it. And we've had our own days of reckoning around that, of coming to understand that tobacco sponsorship and alcohol sponsorship ha- brings with it social issues. And responsible people have debated that properly and thoroughly and responsible sports have taken the appropriate um, actions. Sports washing is, is is just completely different because it, inherently it's, it's about using sport as a tool to improve a reputation that's been basically tarnished by wrongdoing. You know, and it can't, that can be an individual's wrongdoing, a group, a, a corporation, a government. It's a form of propaganda where you wash your reputation by hosting sort of spectacular sporting events like a football World Cup and Guitars case or buying or sponsoring a a big sporting team like Manchester City, uh, again, in the case of the Guitaris, in a sport like golf where you effectively take it over. And it, it all diverts attention away from your, you know, your, your poor human rights records and all the corruption scandals that pretty much engulf everything you do. And and and, that, and we're talking about crimes here, whether that's against the planet around climate change or whether it's um, against the law. It's, it's all reputation laundering. And what, what makes it more um, challenging, more insidious, more dangerous um, than previous forms of, of, of sponsorship um, is that they'll kind of do anything. Private equity scares me too, Sharon, without trying to divert, right? The, the shiny suits of 
of private equity really, really worry me about how they've come into, into sport, including New Zealand rugby. And Silver Lake will invest $200 million in a new commercial entity that will control NZR's, all of NZR's revenue generating assets. With the 26 unions and the Māori board voting in favour of the deal in Auckland yesterday. But the last time I looked, um, if you criticised those sorts of deals, you didn't get kidnapped um, and dismembered like the Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Irony of sports washing, as I see it, is that I think it actually draws attention to your deeds rather than diverting them. But what I'm saying is, going back to your core question, these guys won't stop at anything. Even even Phil Mickelson, who was the leading golfer to jump ship and, and got $300 million and basically backed the right horse. He didn't pretend to be excited about hitching his fortunes to Saudi Arabia, admitting the new league was nothing more than what he called sports washing by a brutally repressive regime. Shipman quotes Mickelson, they're scary mother to get involved with, he said. We know they killed Khashoggi, the Washington Post reporter, um, Jamal Khashoggi, and have a horrible record on human rights. He's quite happy to jump in bed with them, so to speak, to the tune of 300 million, but it brings with it different... um, Different challenges and different things that you don't haven't we haven't had to deal with before around the issue of money into into sport. Right now, sports washing is synonymous with Saudi Arabia, but it's not new. Think 1936 Berlin Olympics, a propaganda exercise for the Nazi regime, but you can wind it back even further, way back. Here's James Hyam, sport and tourism researcher at Griffith University in Brisbane. In my teaching, I sometimes use the example of Alexander the Great, who in 334 BC hosted the Olympian Games in the shadows of Mount Olympus. And he did so not just to showcase Greek sporting prowess, but uh, he did so with a number of really uh, specific strategic outcomes in mind. One was to dispel rumours of Macedonian financial ruin, But he really hosted the Olympian Games to win the favour of his senior officers and other Greek city-state ambassadors on the eve of his departure to uh, the Persian campaign. And most of all, he wanted to impress upon all onlookers his own self-image as a Greek demigod beyond any mortal scale. And he was doing this to create images of his own immortality, to safeguard his leadership during his lengthy absence from from Macedonia during during the Persian campaign. And and in hosting the Olympian Games, he was attracting visitors, dignitaries, ambassadors from across Greece. So these these links between sport and tourism and politics are as old as civilizations themselves. Well, and and that would be a classic example of sport washing, wouldn't it be? Because it's about, really, in the end, it's about propaganda. Yep, and uh, and these these um, enormous global events have been harnessed in this way throughout history. I recall the thriller in Manila in 1975, Muhammad Ali against Joe Frazier three. Doctor comes up and looks at Frazier. I think it's going to be over. It's all over. Why was it hosted in the Philippines? essentially to draw attention uh, away from the corrupt uh, regime of Ferdinand Marcos. How do you see Saudi Arabia in the future as a sports tourism destination? Saudi Arabia has developed a pretty clear strategy to advance economic diversification of its oil economy and sport. And tourism is seen as, as important strategic elements in its future economy. Sport is, is around 0.3% of GDP currently and tourism about 3%, but they're really targeting sport tourism to be about 10% of GDP by 2030. Gee, that's a big leap, isn't it? Especially Saudi Arabia's GDP. So it would be quite a significant force in, in the sports tourism globally by then. Absolutely. They have... Uh, been developing a, a wide range of sports events, such as Formula One, Major League Football Finals, World Boxing Title bouts, Live Golf Tour, also ATP tennis and and horse racing and camel racing and desert polo. You name it, they're 
developing these sports with a particular eye on international markets and tourism. Culturally, if if someone decided that they wanted to go there to watch, say, the Formula One, from what many of us know about Saudi Arabia, do you think it's really geared up for that kind of international tourism? And for, for sports people who don't, you know, who may not necessarily have a good idea of what the country is about and aren't going there for the cultural experience. I think part of the strategy with uh, this sort of approach to sport tourism is is to try and harness the potency of sport and its capacity to attract sports fans with strong emotions and uh, strong identity attachments to particular sports, uh, particular sports teams, iconic sports Um, celebrities. By doing so, there's scope to hijack some of the universal values of sport, excellence, drive and fairness, unity, respect. So yes, there will will be sports fans who uh, will be blindly committed to to supporting their sports teams um, or attending their chosen sports events. There may be others who are are more conscious and more mindful of uh, the places where these sports are being hosted, the locations that they'd need to travel to to experience these sports in person, and you know, may have second thoughts about, uh, about doing so. Surely the Saudi regime is going to have to relax some of its rules, isn't it, around things like drinking, the way you dress, attitudes towards women? Yes and no. It's up to governments and sports organisations to negotiate that fine line. It's a, it's a really good question. Most recently, we've seen the example of the FIFA World Cup hosted in Qatar, the most controversial World Cup in in the history of that event. And uh, the issues that you've just mentioned were managed with quite a hard line in terms of the standing on the rainbow community. World Cup soccer players are now banned from wearing rainbow armbands on the field. Um, Suppressing the efforts of players and teams to express their support for the rainbow community. They have been warned by FIFA officials that wearing the armband would be a breach of its rules and risk a sporting sanction. Questions of alcohol and alcohol consumption. Just two days before the start of the World Cup tournament in Qatar, FIFA announced this morning that beer will be banned at all games. The Qatari government and uh, and FIFA took a very hard line to uh, any resistance uh, on those sorts of issues. So back to our armchair sports fan, Trevor McEwen. He worries that it's creeping closer, dragging New Zealand athletes into it. Saudi Arabia has a goal around the Indian population, uh, now officially the world's biggest country, for Saudi Arabia to be their number one primary tourist destination. But they're going to achieve that by creating a, a similar competition to the IPL Uh, and run it for six weeks in Saudi Arabia. Well, they say Saudi Arabia wants to establish a T20 tournament. A quirk of the IPL is that the Indian players are only allowed to play in that 2020 competition. They can't go to any other 2020 competitions. They'll be allowed to go to this one. It'll be filled with all the other stars, including the Black Caps. And basically, it'll be another huge money-making venture. So what is it that Saudi Arabia is looking for in India? It appears that Saudi Arabia wants Indian businesses and Indian players to drive the tournament or the future Saudi Premier League. We'll hold it in Saudi Arabia. We'll spend a whole bunch of our tourism money in your country to woo um, the uh, Indian fanatical cricket fans to to Saudi Arabia. Do you know that the Black Caps will definitely be part of this competition? Well, they won't be as a team, obviously, because it'll be the same as the IPL, where you, where they they'll create new franchises, um, and they'll and they're talking about mirroring the same names as the IPL ones, and the same players almost being the figureheads over there. So it's quite it's quite ingenious. Trevor, what are the chances that this could happen to rugby? You couldn't rule it out if you go back to the tourism element of of creating a mecca for major events. And a lot of these are based on independent um, venues. So if, for example, you take in a rugby consequence, let's have the Six Nations winners every year play the the rugby championship winners from the Southern Hemisphere every every year. 
it then becomes a question of, uh, well, is that at Twickenham? Is it at Eden Park? Is it in Sydney? Where is it? If you've got somebody like the Saudis saying, we'll host it, and, you know, we'll put up huge prize money too and we'll get one of our government firms to sponsor it, and, uh, but you've got to come and play it here and you've got to sign a 10-year contract. Now, that conceivably could very easily happen. Could they also decide to up in world rugby and create uh, a tournament every six weeks played every year in Saudi Arabia that replaces the Six Nations and others? Yeah, look, potentially. I'm just thinking... Well, people say, why, why, am, why haven't we been so outspoken about other parts of the world, China, for example? Look, going back to what we're talking about, that you know, sport washing is, it can be more than just a government. It can be a competition. It can be an, an individual with a dubious track record and whatnot. Um, but it's, in my view, it's far more insidious and dangerous when it's, when it's government-driven. And the problem is, you know, Sport never learns from its history. Um, look at the scandals involved with FIFA and the Olympic Games as the two biggest sporting events in the world, the corruption, the payoffs over decades. Uh, and unfortunately, sport, it's very easy to find individuals and organisations who will who will indulge in corrupt behaviour, quite frankly, if, the, if there's something in, in it. And uh, I don't think that's, that's ever going to change. Um, it's more apparent in sport and it's a tragedy because we invest so much of ourselves in sport, our emotions and our commitment. It's the tribes that, the, the tribal uh, nature and the tribe that we want to belong to, many of us. And that's why sport is such a passion for it, and in my case, my entire life. So to see it kind of picked apart in this way where the enjoyment is taken out of it and it's no longer fear. I mean, you know, we've seen Manchester City all over our TV screens this week, having having won the treble of the um, of the Champions League, the FA Cup, and the English Premier League. Um, a rare feat, but I don't see anything to celebrate when you've been charged with a hundred breaches um, of the fair financial fair play uh, rules that everybody agreed to. And everybody needs to make their own individual decision on this. But mine's been hastened. Um, Sharon, just simply by how relentless this is and how quickly it's moving. Netball Australia has lost its $15 million sponsorship deal with Gina Reinhart's Hancock Prospecting. Remember the Australian netballers taking a stand against their sponsors? Yeah, Hancock Mining has withdrawn that very crucial $15 million lifeline that Netball Australia so desperately needs. It comes after Australia's Indigenous shooter, Don Wellam, raised concerns about the mining company's history with Indigenous rights. They faced a lot of derision over that, but they quickly secured another sponsor, tourism body Visit Victoria, James Hyam says it's a good example of athlete activism, but there's something else there that's even more powerful. It's really up to uh, fans uh, to think about where they stand on these sorts of issues. The sports washing phenomenon, I think, really does require fan fans to lend their support to athletes who are outspoken. A number of former All Blacks have spoken up against some of the uh, sponsorship deals that the New Zealand Rugby Union has uh, negotiated uh, for the All Blacks, Ineos being an obvious example. Former All Black uh, Bob Burgess is one of more than 100 New Zealanders denouncing New Zealand Rugby for its six-year sponsorship deal with the global chemical group Ineos. Critics say the company is using the deal to greenwash its reputation. And to be linked to a corporation that plays such a driving force in, in climate change and sea level rise threatening island nations, um, such as in those in the South Pacific. Um, we've seen some All Blacks uh, and fans expressing their really um, deep concern and disapproval of these sorts of, of sponsorship agreements. But with this live deal, which has been so controversial, it feels like those players who've spoken out, such as Rory McElroy, they've lost really, haven't they? Well, I'm not sure that they have. I think I think the losers uh, out of live are the players who um, sold out uh, and left the PGA Tour to serve their own financial interests. I think Rory McIlroy, by contrast, actually 
has stood up for, for some of his personal principles and, and has probably, well, certainly lost financially, given the gross sums of money that were available for those who signed up to the Live Tour. But I think he's 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 won in other ways. And uh, I, I guess ultimately it's up for, up to golf fans to decide where they stand on these sorts of issues. Sport-related tourism is an enormously diverse phenomenon, and so too are um, sports fandoms. There's been some interesting research into sports fans, and this um, usefully informs the extent to which their loyalties um, hold with ever-changing environments around sports teams. So there are some sports fans who, who the literature refers to as passionate partisans, and they're really hardcore fans their support is, is really non-negotiable. They support their team regardless, and they're personally invested in the success and failures of the team. So they really don't budge on these sorts of issues. But there are many other forms of uh, fandom, and others are, are less fanatical um, and, and more able to change allegiance, uh, and perhaps follow teams when they start winning um, or become interested in the game. Uh, without necessarily commitment to a particular team or this seasonal commitment to watching a team. They're perhaps more interested in the game than the team. They can move between teams. Some seek entertainment uh, without strong team attachment. And, and other fans are particularly interested in in the, the star players and styles of play, aesthetics, and again, look for skill and, and strategy and tactical complexity over the outcome of a game or the performance of a particular team. So what sports administrators need to appreciate is that they may have a hardcore fan base, but uh, many members of a fandom are perhaps more flexible and more willing to uh, abandon a team or to move away from a team or to express their interest in sport in other ways rather than blindly patriotic loyalty to a particular team. And it's for this reason that sports and sports teams uh, a part of life cycles. They rise and they fall in popularity. And it's really important for sports managers and, and team owners to be conscious of the sentiments within uh, a body of fans, because ultimately it's the fans who own the game. Trevor, I've, I've just got a, a couple of minutes left, but I wanted to ask you, is there anything left that you can sit on your, your armchair and watch on TV and feel good? <laughs> <laughs> um, I enjoy perversely a lot of the young action sports. I enjoy watching the surfing. Um, I, I enjoy uh, things like triathlon and whatnot. I, I just where human endeavour can be can be seen. And 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 one of the great things about television now is the broadcasting quality and what you can do and how deep you can go. But I also sit back there and go, well, when are they going to pick my sport off? I'm kind of in a position now where with um, young young toddlers as grandkids, I'm trying to actually get them participating in sport and getting it off screens and outside, Sharon, and, and maybe not watching it on TV and maybe they're just out there doing it. That's it for today. I'm Sharon Brett Kelly. The detail is supported by the Public Interest Journalism Fund. William Saunders engineered this podcast. Sarah Robson and Bonnie Harrison produced it. Thanks to Trevor McEwen and James Hyam. Kakite Anno. Ka